Well, hello and welcome to the Institute of Health and Social Care Management and the latest in our 20 minute social series. I've got to say today I am absolutely thrilled with the guest who we've managed to persuade to come along and share his expertise and experience with us. We have the fabulous Asan Akpan, who's consultant geriatrician for Liverpool University Hospitals. And we're going to talk today all about ageing and age research. Asan, it's fantastic to have you with us. Thank you so much for agreeing to do so. How has your week been so far? Well, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity to you and Jane and the Institute. Uh, I'm delighted. I'm always delighted to have an opportunity to um, answer questions and and sort of uh, share with people the little knowledge I have. My week has been great. Uh, It started with uh, walking in Aintree Hospital uh, on Monday. And for the last two days, I've been running um, a virtual clinic uh, because actually I spend more of my time outside of the hospital as a community geriatrician, uh, working with a multidisciplinary team, which includes social workers. Fantastic. Well, that sounds like a great start to the week for you. We have got Jane Reitzman here, our General Manager for Social Care, and I will bring in Jane periodically to add to the discussion and the the flow of information but as I think let's just dive straight into this help us to understand where are we right now with age and aging research in the United Kingdom can you give us a a situation report yes I, I would say we're beginning to be in a very good place now compared to, let's say, 10 to 15 years ago, where we were, there were fewer people doing age and aging research. But now, um, with the help of the National Institute for Health Research, uh, which has uh, 15 branches nationwide, which are called the Clinical Research Networks, um, we have been very lucky uh, with the support of that organization that has helped uh, to raise awareness about research in general. But as part of that, we have, um, we have been able to encourage and facilitate and support those who are interested in doing aging research, irrespective of their professional background. So it's not just doctors we're talking about here. Could be social workers, could be nurses, could be therapists. Um, anyone really who is interested, even older people themselves, if they want to be part of it, we're increasingly involving them. So I would say a lot of people now in the UK are aware that there is um, opportunities to be involved in aging research and that older people are in no way excluded from it. So we are, we are in a very good place but we still got a long way to go compared to, say, the United States, who do a lot of research in aging. Um, but in terms of clinical medicine for older people, we are far ahead of other people. So we're in a good place, but we've got, we've got more to do. Could you give us an, an indication of some of the projects that you're working on now that really catch your imagination and attention? Yes. So, um, as you can imagine, (laughs) we are contributing a lot to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic research, especially as it impacts care homes. So, there are colleagues of mine who are experts in care home research um, um, based in Nottingham and in other parts of the country. um, And we are part of that research. So, we're recruiting care homes from all over the country. Um, into various aspects of this research. The latest one we're looking at is to try and understand the different types of treatments that might be best for people who live in care homes to reduce their risk of um, getting the infection in the first place. And if they do get it, what's the best combination of treatment that might be best for them? So that's, that's about to start now. Um, so that that is a that is a real pleasure for me because again um, a few years ago there was hardly any research in care homes there was hardly any research in care homes and when you think about it people who live in care homes are the most vulnerable are the most at risk 
for anything. If anything happens to them, they actually get ill very quickly. And we don't have, we didn't have very good ideas on how best to treat them. And that's now beginning to change. Perfect. It strikes me one of the one of the central problems that I, I know from personal family experience and so on is is the prevalence of UTIs, urinary tract infections, in older people as they forget to hydrate and so on. Have you managed to make any progress there around means by which? older people can be encouraged to hydrate properly. Okay, so there are two things there. One is, one thing we found with the diagnosis of the urinary tract infection is that sometimes that that's not quite accurate because of the process by which the diagnosis is made. To be actually certain that someone has got a urinary tract infection and it's not just a concentrated urine, um, you need to send a sample of the urine to the microbiology lab for them to be able to actually identify the bug and find out which antibiotic it is sensitive to. So for many years, we used to go by, you know, oh, the urine is a bit offensive and people, and then the person is unwell and people might link the two together. And sometimes that's not quite the right link. There might be something else going on, like a chest infection, or they could just be dehydrated and all they need is to be well hydrated. So the issue of trying to get the right diagnosis, again, not necessarily through research, but campaigning and education, we're beginning to change that also so that people are, make, are going through the right process to make the right diagnosis. But you're right that hydration is an issue, infection generally is an issue. And again, um, while there isn't a national campaign, I know that in various parts of the countries, colleagues, um, nurses, doctors, working with care homes have been trying to raise awareness about the importance of keeping people well hydrated because that will flush the uh, kidney system and prevent the risk of someone getting an infection or getting so dehydrated that they need to be transported to hospital. Yeah, quite. So well, forgive me, I just wanted to ask that question because it's a particular yes. Uh, yes. thing that I was aware of. Um, can you help us then? Help us to understand how do we enable ageing research to expand and, and, and be even more innovative and, uh, and help us in terms of then caring for older people? How do we enable aging research to be more widespread? Okay, excellent question. Um, I'll come at it from the challenges I think that I and my colleagues have faced who are interested in doing research and maybe point out some of the challenges and maybe if we had more support with some of those challenges, which may not be unique to research and aging, that might help. So one of the issues is time. So if you are a clinician, um, and by clinician, again, I mean a wide variety of people, and I include social workers in that, you know, you've got your job, you're busy, but you want to do the best you can for older people. And part of that is being, you know, you come across something, I think, oh, I would like to do more about that. I would like to do some research, but, you know, the day job takes over. So one is creating the time in an individual's uh, job plan and to create that time probably involves um, employing someone else to do a session or two so that that individual who is interested in doing research can have that time uh, to work with university colleagues uh, to develop a research proposal and then apply for a grant and then have time to actually carry out the research. So the NIHR has recognized this and does try through various programs to support clinicians who are interested. And in the Northwest Coast, for example, we run various um, programs to support early career researchers where we will give, people will apply with a project and then we would give some funds to the hospital that will pay for half a day and the hospital or the trust will match that by also paying for half a day. So the person gets a full day in a week, every week for a year or two to try and develop a research project that will lead to a grant application. And then once you get a big grant, that usually is able to pay back for some of your time 
and for funding the research. But it's usually that initial stage where you're trying to develop the idea that there's a lot of time involved in risk, you know, reading the literature, um, having meetings, stakeholder meetings, and then writing the project. And I'm busy social workers, doctors, nurses, therapists, it's a struggle to put that into their day job. People do. I mean, I've done it. Other people have done it, but it limits the amount of research that we could do if we had more time. And it must so that's, be, that's a key challenge. Yeah, it must be. It, it strikes me. I'm going to bring in Jane in a moment just to make a comment or two in this regard. It, it must be, let's say you work in social care and, and you're involved with, old, with care of older people specifically. And you've got an inkling that if we did something differently, we might get a better outcome. But you have no background of proper clinical research. It must be a pretty intimidating process to try to go through to actually get your research document prepared properly so that it will bear scrutiny and you actually might get some funding for it. Jane, have you got any comments from a social care perspective where, you know, this might be a, a situation that you're familiar with? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, you're absolutely right, John. I think I think that's something that social care hasn't traditionally got involved in because, you know, we, we, we don't have those kind of skills and that background in, in the sector, really. And Asan, I was going to ask you, have you got any advice for social care managers who might be really interested in, in finding out more about research or getting involved? What, what could they do on a practical basis? Absolutely. Uh, on a practical basis. So I, we work in multidisciplinary teams. So, for example, when I'm sitting in a care home MDT later this afternoon, uh, there's going to be a social worker there. And for me, it would be fantastic if the social worker said to me, oh, Asan, I've been thinking about this and uh, could we knock heads together and, and do something together? So when I started in research and I was still class myself, I still a starter, I'm not, you know, like, like some other people who are really high flyers. I always partner with someone who is, who, who sort of knows how to do these things, but they may not know the field. So the social worker will know exactly their area and they know what the issues are. But as you said, they want to do some research in it. So partner with those who are already doing it. Ask colleagues that you're on the MDT with, do you know anyone? May, they may not, the person in the MDT may not be, but they'll probably know someone who does a bit of research. So that's the informal approach. But in each uh, part of the United Kingdom, we have the clinical research networks. And um, depending on what the social worker wants to do the research, and if it's in children, there will be a lead for pediatrics. If it's in older people, there will be an aging research lead. If it's in cancer. So we have leads in all these areas. And what they need to do is go up and have a chat with them about their research idea. And again, they will be linked into a network of university colleagues. So there are social workers who are full-time academics. And they will be able to support the social worker in developing their idea through that little network some discussions will start and linkages will start universities are always looking for good ideas that have impact on people's lives so actually they will welcome this approach because they may not be aware of these problems because they are not actually in the field so partnerships networking working i'm always delighted when people come up to me and that's that's always been the most successful research that I've done, where someone comes with an idea that they are passionate about. I may not have a clue about it, but it does impact on older people. And we work together with university colleagues and develop a proposal. And then Brilliant. we take it forward. That, that sounds great. And, and, it, and it would be great for them to have the confidence to, <laughs> to, to, to do that. And, and certainly a lot of the care home managers and the, the, you know, the home care, the domiciliary care managers, they'll be doing projects through their qualifications um, where they're asked to sort of research something. And I imagine some of them would love to take the research that they've done further. So that's a really great piece of advice. Yes. And then the other thing to mention is that we have this um, Enrich Enabling Research and Care Home Database where all care homes who are interested in research are registered on it. So again, that's another place that the social worker will find a good network. Um, up here in the 
Northwest Coast have been running a campaign to get as many of our care homes onto that database as possible. Fantastic. Well, look, that, well, that's a good outcome. You're going to be swamped now with social <laughs> care people suddenly <laughs> saying, oh, goodness me, I've mm-hmm. got a research project. And look, let's hope so, you know. Let's it's hope so. fantastic to get more research going from people who, as you quite rightly say, Asan, have a real passion for it. Yes. I think that um, my final question to you is going to be, how can research change or adapt the means by which we care for older people? In other words, well, perhaps you can give some examples of recent research that's finished, and actually that's resulted in a material way by which we choose to uh, change the way by which we care for older people. Okay. Um, let me start with general a general comment. We know that any department, any unit, any any setting that gets involved in research, whether it's the people themselves or the department or unit as a whole, once you get involved in research, it's been observed and verified that the quality of care just improves in that environment, just by osmosis, because you're sort of up to date, you're liaising with people who are reading up to date information, you're learning how to follow protocol. So it translates into the care you give. You tend to follow protocols, guidelines. You tend to have a questioning mind, a critical mind. So that's everybody. And that sort of permeates and improves the care that people receive. So just by being involved in research, by by having your unit, department, care home, um, people that you see involved in research and helping out that 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 just improves the care. That's that's been proven in every sphere. So that's number one to note. Um, where to start um, with um, some good examples? I have to think hard now. There are so many. I, I've put you on the spot. Yes, there. I'm so what, sorry. What, no, no, no. There's no problem. What I would suggest is that while I'm thinking about it, one good resource that's open and available to anybody is the British Geriatric Society. We've got a, a website. If people go on that website, they will see good examples, especially related to COVID, where we've um, developed a page specifically for COVID. And there are some uh, reviews and research that has come through that we are now sharing with everybody so that people who are looking after care homes, for example, can go up there and look at, at, at um, guidance and advice. And all of that has been developed uh, through research. And that is now having a direct impact on the care of older people in care homes. So that's for you uh, an example of how research uh, supported by, you know, our organization is, is, is improving care for older people. I but think, also I think been... that's a great answer because we are slightly okay. short of time. So go to the okay. BGS uh, website and you, there's a wealth of case study information there. All right, Asan, I did promise you when yes. we were in the green room prior to this uh, little interview mm-hmm. that at the end I turn into a genie and I, and I yes. give you the lamp and you rub it furiously with the sleeve of your jacket <laughs> and you are granted... We've probably got time for one wish. Yes. Come on. So there you go. I poof. There I am. I grant you one wish by which you can change an aspect of research or older people's care. My one wish would be that we would have more support, um, not just in terms of finance, but in terms of priority so that people appreciate and understand that if we actually do research in older people older people use a lot of health and social care resources so it makes sense that we should do a lot of research with them um, and in them uh, because the outcomes then will be very meaningful and then that will improve the quality of life and also reduce the uh, socio-economic burden on on the system because we would be more efficient, we would have found better processes of looking after people. Okay, well, I grant the wish, Asan. Thank you. And it shall happen. You watch now. (laughs) You watch, you know. But look, that's been an absolute tour de force. I knew it would be fantastic. Um, Personally, I feel very inspired to go off and encourage our members to take part in research, uh, particularly into... uh, 
the aging population, but actually research of any type, because I think you're right. I think it does drive a higher quality of care, generally speaking. My thanks to Jane for coming along and setting this up in the first place and for her insights. And Asan, I must say, we are extraordinarily grateful to you. That was a superb insight into the world of ageing research and we're in your debt. I am sure that we shall meet again. So thanks a million. Uh, if you enjoyed that, stay tuned because there are more along the pipeline. We've got plenty more of our 20 minute socials to come. But for now, that's it from us. Thanks so much for listening in and we'll see you next time. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.